Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivo Siegmann. Welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is co-organized by the University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester, and Liverpool John Moores University. Today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University, and it will be presented by Dr. Sarah Jabari from the University of Birmingham. I would also like to give a preview of our next seminars. We'll have two seminars next week, one on Monday by Angela Relogio and Dr. Janina Hesse from the Charité in Berlin, then one by Said Shuai from King's College in London. And on Monday in the week after that, we will have Nazir Rajput from Warwick. I would now like to introduce to you today's speaker, Sarah Jabari got her first degree from Durham University, and then she went on to do a PhD with John King in Nottingham, which she completed in 2007. In her research, Sarah has either looked at new ways for making bacteria do good things, I think. After her PhD, she stayed in Nottingham for a postdoc on a project investigating the production of biofuels by a bacteria. And on the other hand, she has done a lot of research into preventing bacteria from doing bad things. So I think a lot of her more recent work has been on antibiotic resistance and treatments that might help avoiding it. Sarah won a biomedical informatics fellowship funded by the Medical Research Council and was then appointed a Birmingham Fellow in 2012. She is now a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham and um, yeah, on the university website, I found out that she recently featured in the book, Once Upon a Time in Birmingham, Women Who Dare to Dream, about inspiring women in Birmingham. We are very honored to have Sarah with us today. And I look forward to her talk on mathematical modeling to advance novel treatments. Um, yeah, over to you, Sarah. I will make this screen disappear. Lovely. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for having me here today. I really, I really like what you've done by combining um, regional universities into one seminar series. I think it's a really great idea. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about mathematical modelling to advance um, novel treatments for uh, for bacterial infections. Um, and I'm going to. So if you've seen me give seminars before, then you'll probably know I, I quite like to split uh, my seminars up into. Um, mini sort of sub projects, because uh, personally, I find it quite easy for my mind to drift during seminars. So I always think it's quite a, a nice idea to have different um, mini um, topics within there so that if somebody does drift off, there's time for you to, to come back in. So I'll start with an, an introduction to the biology. And then I've got three, um, well, I've listed three mini projects I'm gonna, that, that I have slides for, but I'm actually only going to talk about um, two of them. Um, I don't think I'll have time for, for the last one. Um, but I'll give you a brief overview of what the, the biology is in that one if we if I do have time for that. Um, although if I talk really fast, I'll get through all three of them, but my plan is just to just to do the first two. Um, so AMR and the need for new treatments. So AMR, for anyone who uh, isn't aware, is antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance. So antibiotics, they are widely used to treat uh, bacterial infections. You will presumably have all had a course of antibiotics at some point in your life, and they work by directly killing bacteria or inhibiting their growth. And in general, they are extremely successful. When they work, they're absolutely brilliant, and we've had them for around 100 years or so. Um, but as you will all be aware, um, there are issues with um, antibiotics. It's been decades since we had um, a, a new class of antibiotics that has been discovered. And we're now seeing um, resistance to all types of existing classes of antibiotics um, in all regions of the world. So it, in years gone by, uh, when bacteria developed resistance to a particular type of antibiotic, it was sort of not not always considered to be a huge problem because there was always another class that could be used, but that's no longer the case in some, um, some situations. It's a particular problem in um, developing countries where antibiotics are um, often more readily available. So you might be able to buy them over the counter or sometimes buy them on the black market rather than having to um, actually have a doctor's prescription for those antibiotics. And that can mean that you have overuse of antibiotics, misuse of antibiotics, and that will contribute to the development of um, resistance in those bacteria. Uh, 
So our own um, government commissioned a report back in 2014 looking into antimicrobial resistance that predicted that if we don't do anything to combat antimicrobial resistance, then by 2050, there'll be an estimated 10 million deaths um, per year attributable to anti antimicrobial resistance because of the knock-on effect that you have onto other medical um, issues such as cancer treatment or, or surgery. Now this number here, 10 million deaths is sort of, it's quite disputed um, now in the, in the community, um, but it certainly looks good on grant applications. So um, we all have a tendency to, to leave it in there and still use it. Um, so we need alternatives to antibiotics. And one approach is to look at um, the concept of antivirulence drugs. So antibiotics work by directly killing bacteria or inhibiting their growth. Antivirulence drugs are a, a sort of a new strategy that um, many people are looking at, which, would, which actually involves weakening the bacteria. So rather than directly killing them, you weaken them, you inhibit their virulence mechanisms or the mechanisms that they use to survive treatment. And, uh, and in that way, you sort of prevent them from being able to cause um, infection. And I work with quite a lot of microbiologists who are looking at targeting these kinds of mechanisms with new, with new drugs, new treatments. Um, now, bacteria are incredibly clever little organisms. They use a huge range of different mechanisms to both cause infection and to survive treatment. But what that means is we've got a huge range of different mechanisms that we can target with, um, with antimicrobial, uh, sorry, with, with novel treatments with these antivirulence drugs. And I put a handful up here um, as examples of um, uh, infection mechanisms and survival mechanisms that we've worked on in, in my group with my colleagues. Um, but the two that I'm actually going to talk about today is persistent formation and efflux pumps, both of which are survival mechanisms. So I've, I sort of label this antivirulence drugs, but these are actually mechanisms that bacteria use to survive treatment. Um, now, there's a lot of excitement about antivirulence drugs um, in the community. Um, less so with the sort of diehard die hard antibiotic fans, but um, uh, generally speaking, a lot of people are quite excited about this concept. In particular, because there's a, there's a sort of idea that because you're not directly killing bacteria, they might be less likely to develop resistance to, to these treatment types. I think it's unlikely that they wouldn't develop um, resistance. I think it might just take longer for that resistance to, to show through. But they, there is a lot of excitement around these types of treatments, but there's one major flaw to them, and that is that they don't currently clear infections, which is, you know, the one thing that you really want your um, treatments to actually do. So they're not, I'm, I'm calling them drugs, I shouldn't call them drugs because none of them are um, used in the clinic yet, but they, they will be and tested in the lab. And what preliminary, preliminary results are showing is that they weaken the bacterial load, so sorry, they lower the bacterial load, but they don't actually clear the, the bacterial infection, they just Put you in a slightly um, better position um, but not actually clearing it. So I work with quite a lot of microbiologists who try to, who are trying to understand um, firstly why those treatments aren't fully successful um, but more importantly I guess how to make them more um, more effective. And I'm going to talk about two of the two of the applications today. So the first is targeting changes in um, cell morphology or the ability of certain bacteria to form what are called persister cells. And the bacteria I'm going to talk about in this section is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Some of you will be familiar with it. It's a pathogenic gram-negative nosocomial bacteria. So nosocomial means it um, is hospital associated. Um, it's particularly dangerous for immunocompromised patients and causes all sorts of different um, infections. And we do see multi-antibiotic resistant strains of Pseudomonas in existence around the world. And it's for these reasons that the World Health Organization has labeled Pseudomonas as a priority pathogen um, at the critical level for the development of new treatments. So the um, project on, I've worked on several different aspects of Pseudomonas, but the, this uh, particular one that I'm going to talk about today um, has largely been done by uh, Chloe Spaulding, who uh, was my first PhD student um, who graduated uh, recently. And this is, this is all her work, so she, she gets the credit for this. Um, so Chloe came across this paper, um, Monahan et al, uh, quite early on in her PhD and was, and was quite excited about it. Um, and it eventually went on to form um, the, the, the thread that held all of her um, thesis together. So these are images of um, Pseudomonas in, um, in their happy form. So when they're um, growing and reproducing, then they, are, they take on this rod-shaped form. And you can see some down here that are in the process of dividing into the two daughter cells. 
pseudomonas have a slightly unusual um, behavior if you expose them to certain types of antibiotics. So if you expose them to beta-lactams, beta-lactams are a type of antibiotic that target um, synthesis of, of the cell wall. That's how they work. But pseudomonas, if you expose it to meropenem, which is, sorry, which is a beta-lactam um, antibiotic, if you expose, expose it to meropenem, some of the cells will die, the antibiotic will function in um, as it's supposed to, but some of the cells start to form these spherical cells. So they shed a particular aspect of their cell wall that sort of holds them together so that they um, convert into these spherical cells. But by shedding that aspect of the cell wall, they've also lost the target for the meropenem. So the antibiotic is no longer affected, effective on the cells that are in this spherical shape. So they're essentially, hiding from, um, from the meropenem when they're, when they're in this form. And if you remove the antibiotic from the environment of the cells, they can revert back to being rod-shaped cells. Um, so it's, it's, this sort of um, technique is often referred to as um, persister, um, persister cells. It's not the same as being resistant um, because of this ability to revert back into essentially antibiotic susceptible cells. So it's not the same thing as resistance, but it's called persistence, which is slightly different. Um, so this has been posited as a, a potential good target for, um, for novel treatments. If you can target the, the spherical cells specifically, um, then perhaps we'll be in, in, a, in a good place to, to treat pseudomonas with meropenem still. So Chloe was really excited by this, so she uh, wanted to model it. Um, so the first thing that you do is draw a schematic of what's going on. So we've got here B for rod-shaped bacteria. That's not much of a rod there, more of an oval, but it's, it's representing these rod-shaped ones up here. They um, reproduce in the presence of nutrients. If you add antibiotic into the environment, then some of these rod-shaped cells will turn into spheres, but some of them will die. So it isn't the case that all of them turn into spheres, just a, a subpopulation of them do. So D down here is just for dead cells. If you remove the antibiotic, then the spherical cells have the ability to transition back into rod-shaped cells so that they can continue proliferating. So that's why I didn't mention actually the, the spherical cells don't, they don't divide and grow as far as we know. Um, they're probably less virulent. We're not um, clear, particularly clear on that, but we, it's assumed that they'll be less virulent and that they won't grow and divide, they're just dormant. So if you remove the antibiotic, they can revert back into being rod-shaped cells. Um, but one thing to note also is that they're quite fragile, the spherical cells, so because they've shed this aspect of their cell wall, they're quite prone to um, popping, essentially, um, and, and dying naturally. So to make a model of this, we were initially looking at an in vitro environment, so we can assume that everything's well mixed and, and look at an ODE model for this. So we've just used mass action kinetics and some saturation kinetics where appropriate to, to model these, um, these transitions. Now, of course, there's lots of um, parameters in here that need um, estimating. And we were quite fortunate at the time to have a technician in our group, Emma Keane, who was able to uh, conduct almost any experiment that we asked of her. So she began with uh, generating some growth curves for us. Um, so the red crosses and the error bars, that's obviously the experimental data. And then the blue line is our model fit in the absence of antibiotics to the, um, to the data. You can see it's, it's quite a nice fit for, for the most part, but we undershoot down here for the initial condition um, and we don't capture the lag phase. And now we could have introduced extra parameters to capture that lag phase, um, but we really didn't think it was, uh, it was worth it. Um, we weren't particularly interested in the lag phase. It's the long-term behavior that we're, we're after. So we, we settled for this compromise. I should mention that what we're calculating in the experimental work is the optical density. So that's a measurement of the total number of bacteria in a flask that, you, that you're growing. Um, and there is a slight compl complication in that um, rod-shaped cells and spherical cells will contribute differently to, um, to the optical density. So the normal thing to do would be to convert your optical density into estimated cell number. Um, but because of this difference in size between the rods and the, and the spheres, we, it, it seemed it was more practical to leave things in terms of optical density and convert our variables into reflection of optical density instead. So this is just a growth curve. And then obviously we had kill curves as well where we grew the bacteria or Emma grew the bacteria at different concentrations of, um, of meropenem. 
So you can see even at high concentrations of meropenem, we get um, a persistent population um, showing. So even very, very high concentrations of antibiotic over the course of the experiment, the bacteria don't, don't die off. And we assume that this is because of their ability to form um, these spherical cells. Um, so we've got the, the red lines are still the data, and then we've got a model fit underneath those um, red crosses and with the with the error bars in there. And if your eyesight is good enough, you'll be able to see that there are actually two lines underneath the um, red lines, depends on how big your laptop screen is, I guess. Um, and they were two different model fits. So there were a couple of unidentifiable parameters in the model, and they were relating to the antibiotic sink terms. So the rate of antibiotic degradation and the rate of um, the rate at which antibiotic is used up in the process of killing bacteria, and that's um, it's perfectly normal that they would be unidentifiable because we're not able to actually measure um, antibiotic concentration over time. All we know is the amount that we put in initially. So under these concentrations and over these time courses, um, we the both um, model fits are, are equally good. But if we simulate the model for longer, then we see um, very different qualitative behavior, but only at low concentrations of the antibiotic. So we've got two parameter sets, theta one and theta two. For theta one, if we take the low antibiotic concentration of two micrograms per mil and simulate the um, simulation, the model for longer, so the time the experiment only runs up, um, up until about this point, then under the first parameter set, where, let me get this the right way around, where antibiotic kicks around in the system for longer because those sink terms are smaller, um, then we predict that the in the long term, if conditions didn't change, then the, the bacteria would, would all die out because of exposure, both exposure to the antibiotic that kicks around in the system for longer, but also because nutrients start to run out as well. Whereas for the second parameter set, because those sink terms are higher, our model predicts that actually at some stage you're going to run out of antibiotic and you get regrowth of the of the bacteria. And we do see this sometimes in, in experimental conditions at, at low antibiotic concentration. So the obvious thing to do, some of you will be thinking, well, run your experiments for a bit longer, see which of these two behaviors you get. But actually, if you if you run the experiment for longer, then meropenem actually starts to trigger different types of bacterial behavior. They start to form filaments and clump together and form biofilms and stuff. So it's not the, the conditions change and the model would need to change in the, in the longer term as well. So it wasn't that simple, but we were able to generate additional experimental data to try and validate which of the two um, parameter sets was um, was better. Um, so we've got another growth curve here, a slightly messier one this time. Um, but so these are, we've now fixed the parameters from how we've um, uh, estimated them from the previous data, and we're fitting to a new to new data sets here. So the growth curve works nicely, um, and then the kill curves at different concentrations of the antibiotic now. Um, for the higher concentrations, you can see because we're in this saturating regime, um, everything still fits very nicely. And then at the lower concentration, so 0.5 micrograms per mil and one microgram per mil now, we get the slightly different behavior between the two um, parameter fits. And you do also see, just to point out, we see this regrowth of the, um, of the bacteria as one of the parameter sets um, predicted. But actually, if you, if you just to look at this by eye, then it looks like parameter set one, which is the blue line, sort of fits slightly better. Um, than the green one, which is really having to massively undershoot the, ex the initial conditions to, to try and capture the, um, the, the fit of the, of the data. So the only thing we've re-estimated was the initial condition. Um, so by eye, at least, the parameter set one looks like it's going to be better here, but you can't tell the difference enough to definitely be able to say one is better than the other. So we proceeded with all of our analysis um, with both sets of parameters um, and sent it off for review. Um, and most of the reviewers were happy with it, but one of them came back with a very valid point, which was that we weren't yet actually using all of our experimental data to either parameterize or validate our model. So we'd also produced um, some microscopy data simply to illustrate that this transition was occurring in our lab as well. So this is at 0.5 micrograms per mil of meropenem. You can see after one hour, most of the cells are still rod shaped. After six hours, you can see the spheres forming. And then after 22 hours, if you've got good eyesight, you can just about see some of them starting to revert back into, into being rod-shaped bacteria. Now, we hadn't considered using this in our parameterization because um, the experimental setup was so different for, for taking these microscopy images. 
Um, but the reviewer, very, very rightly, this is one of those cases where um, reviewers are brilliant and really can improve your work, um, suggested that actually, although the experimental setup is different, we can use the microscopy data to test our solutions for proportions of rods and spheres. So it's sort of comparable in that sense. So rather than trying to count um, uh, numbers of rods or spheres as we go along, we can say, well, what proportion of the total population are rods and what proportion are spheres? And I didn't, <laughs> I was a bit worried at this point. I thought, well, it's probably not going to fit the model. We've all worked with biological data before everything. This is where everything starts to go wrong. But actually, it works really, really nicely. Um, so this is a bit of a stupid slide, just to, just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about. So um, this is an example with um, no antibiotic added at all to the, um, to the environment of the cells. And then if that happens, you don't get any transition to spherical cells because there's no, no need for the bacteria to do that. So the entire population stays up at, uh, as rod shaped over the course of the experiment. And you get zero for the um, spherical cells over the course of the experiment. So we get obviously perfect model fits for zero micrograms per mil. At 0.5 micrograms per mil, so a little bit of antibiotic, we get really, really good set, uh, model fits for the um, second parameter set. So the, the one that actually looked worse before now comes out to be um, a lot better. Qualitatively, the first parameter set looks okay, but quantitatively, it's not capturing the right behavior. Now, obviously things can't stay this good um, forever. So it's not quite as good at, at the only other concentration of antibiotic that we had microscopy images for, which was two micrograms per mil. We still get very good fit for um, parameter set two early on, um, but then we, we're not capturing this final data point um, for parameter set uh, two. And parameter set one is qualitatively completely off now. So we, this now leads us to believe that actually parameter set two probably is, is the better um, parameter set. And um, we obviously spent a long time trying to work out what was going on with these, these data points here. So what's, what the data is telling us is that by this time point that the, the, the bacteria have al almost entirely transitioned back to being um, rod-shaped spheres, uh, sorry, rod-shaped bacteria, not spheres. And what we think is happening is um, when we plate the, the bacteria for taking the images, we, we're covering them and essentially we think that we're probably popping those spheres artificially. So some of those spheres, because I mentioned earlier, they're, they're particularly fragile. We think some of those will be dying um, early because of the way the, the experiment has to be carried out. So it's artificially returning the population back to being um, rod shaped. Um, cells entirely too too soon and it may be that if we were able to um, evade that um, then over time perhaps the the experimental data actually would look um, a little bit more like what we've got for um, parameter set two. Um, so we were quite happy with that that obviously improved improved our work and it, it improved our predictions. But all I've got so far, all I've shown you is that we've we developed a model that um, captures what we see in the in the lab really nicely. Obviously, we want to use that model to to actually do something. Um, and that thing is to try and make treatments more effective. So the idea that people have is that um, okay, so we can treat the an infection with meropenem, but then could we also add in antimicrobial peptides which would target the spherical cells directly? Um, so we know that there are peptides that exist that would pop those um, spherical cells. So surely if we add in um, antibiotics and these peptides together, um, then we should be able to kill off both types of, of cell. And so to simulate this, um, to keep things as simple as possible, all we've done is increase the, the natural death rate of spherical cells and say, okay, that's equivalent to adding in these antimicrobial peptides. Um, so if we just look at the plot on the left to, to begin with, this is um, two micrograms per mil of, um, of meropenem. And the red line is our default solution for the default um, death rate of the spherical cells. And that's actually the same simulation I showed you a couple of slides back where you get this regrowth at low um, antibiotic concentrations. And then as we move from the red line through to the purple line, we are increasing the spherical cell death rate. So you can see we move from a situation where the antibiotic um, is ineffective to a situation where the antibiotic is effective with the help of these peptides and the, the whole population will clear. In the higher antibiotic concentration scenario, so 10 micrograms per mil, where our simulation suggests that perhaps in the long term, the, the bacteria could be cleared, but not in the short term, 
then um, again, the red line is our default um, parameter set. If we move from the red line to the purple line, we are increasing the death rate of these spherical cells, which is equivalent to adding in more and more peptides. We can make that treatment more effective more quickly. So this looks really promising. There may be some buts coming. <laughs> but we thought, okay, everything, everything we've done so far is simply representing an in vitro experiment, a lab experiment. That's not quite enough. Um, so what we wanted to do was take it up to a sort of infection level model and actually incorporate an immune response. Now there's lots of unknowns in um, how we would go about doing this, and um, particularly because there's a lot of unknowns around the spherical cells. So we kept our model of the immune system as simple as possible. We've used a logistic growth term to um, capture um, immune cells being recruited to the um, to the immune site and then uh, sorry to the infection site and then had uh, used mass action kinetics to represent the immune cells killing the bacteria so there's two parameters really to, to think of the first is the recruitment rate so how fast are the how fast can the immune cells travel to the infection site and then the second is um how well do the immune cells how quickly can the immune cells gobble up the the bacteria and we don't know how those rates would compare between rod-shaped cell, cells and spherical cells um, because we simply don't know enough about how um, spheres interact with the, with, um, with the immune system, these spherical cells. Um, so we considered lots of different cases where these rates varied between the two, but I'm just going to show you one particular case which threw up what we thought were the most um, interesting results. And that is that the immune cell recruitment rate is the same for rods as it is for spheres. So they will travel, they will attract them in at the same rate, but that the phagocytosis rate is lowest for lower for the spheres. So the immune cells find it harder to gobble up the spherical cells than they do the rod-shaped cells. And now I say I'm showing you these because um, they throw up the most interesting results, but they, they all, this also happens to be the scenario that when we've talked to biologists, um, they think is probably the most, uh, most likely scenario. And I'm going to jump right through uh, Chloe's entire PhD to the, to the very end and also incorporate antibiotic resistance um, into, the, into the model. So it's saying that antibiotic resistant bacteria can emerge. So we've now got four subpopulations. So we've got antibiotic susceptible rods, antibiotic susceptible spheres, um, antibiotic resistant rods and antibiotic resistant spheres. So I'll show you all this in a schematic because I think it's easier that way. So we've got susceptible rods that can be killed by the antibiotic. Um, but in the presence of antibiotics, some of those rods will transition into um, susceptible spheres. Now, when I call them antibiotic susceptible spheres, I don't mean that the antibiotic can kill them. I mean that when they revert back to being rods, they are then um, antibiotic susceptible. And then we have an immune response, which is attracted in equally by both rods and spheres, but the immune cells find it easier to kill the rods than they do the spheres. They'll do that more quickly. And then for the resistant cells, we've got a mirror image with the exception that the antibiotic has more difficulty killing the resistant rods. So the resistant bacteria don't tend to be fully resistant. They're, they're, they tend to be partially resistant in, in general. So the antibiotic can still have an effect on these resistant rods, um, but it will just be a, a lower effect. But everything else happens in, in exactly the same way. And again, when I talk about resistant spheres here, what I mean is that when they transition back into rods, they transition back into antibiotic resistant rods. Okay. So I'm not gonna show you the model that we made of this because it's just a whole heap of um, ordinary differential equations. Again, we're in ODE territory, we're, we're assuming everything is well mixed. Um, and I will just jump straight to um, a couple of simulations, just two simulations to, um, to show where things can start getting tricky. So the first simulation is just treatment with antibiotics alone. Um, so we've got the susceptible bacteria along the top and the resistant bacteria along the bottom, and we have rods and we have spheres. So we're simulating with antibiotic over the course, so a continuous dose of antibiotic over the course of the, of the simulation. And our dominant population here is the antibiotic resistant spheres. Because the susceptible rods, they are either killed by the antibiotic or they transition very quickly into um, susceptible spheres, which then have a low, um, a sort of slow um, death phase just from natural um, popping of the, of the cells. You can see there's a different, um, we're on different timescales for these plots. 
Whereas the, resi the resistance seers, they don't have this slow death phase because they're continuously being replenished by a very low level of antibiotic resistant rods that are surviving the antibiotic treatment. So these are our dominant um, population. So then the assumption would be that if you add in antimicrobial peptides, they are going to target these antibiotic resistant spheres and whatever's remaining of the susceptible spheres, and we should have a treatment that's fully successful. But that's not what we actually see. So what we now see, if you simulate adding in antimicrobial peptides as well, is that um, the dominant population becomes antibiotic resistant rods. And that is the worst case scenario because these are actively virulent, these are actively growing and they're actively and uh, antimicrobial resistant. So this is exactly the situation that we don't want to be in. So how have we got here? Well, it's basically because the antimicrobial peptides, they are, they are very quickly reducing the number of spheres, but that also, the way we've set our model up at least, would, would reduce um, the immune response. There are fewer cells there recruiting in immune response, so you get a lower um, load of, um, of immune cells. So actually what the modeling is suggesting here, if we've got our assumptions right, is that adding antimicrobial peptides actually might make your infection worse and might enable or encourage antibiotic resistance to, um, to emerge. Um, and obviously I've, I've shown you one parameter set for this. Um, we've, we do a lot of OD modeling with a lot of unknown parameters. So we've done full parameter suites and lots of parameter sensitivity um, surveys to show um, which regimes we need to be in for, for this sort of behavior to occur. But it is, it looks like it could be um, possible. So that's just to summarize this, um, this little project. Um, so Pseudomonas can change its cell uh, structure in response to certain antibiotics. Um, and antimicrobial pe peptides that destroy spherical cells um, look like they might be good in vitro, but actually might be quite risky to, to use in vitro. So we really need to understand the immune response much better um, to be able to, to predict whether or not they would be useful or detrimental in, a, in, a, um, in an actual infection scenario. And I really, I, I picked out the one sort of um, set of parameters and model assumptions um, that showed us it, it there could be this negative effect. There were plenty of situations where, um, where actually adding the antimicrobial peptides looked much more positive, um, but that, that's not a particularly interesting um, result to show you. So there, there are, there are um, potential positives there as well, but we really can't say until we have a better understanding of the interaction with the, with the immune response. And um, if there's anybody here who um, specializes in modeling in immunology, I would love to have a chat with you about the best way to, to go about incorporating more complex immune responses. Um, okay, so that is um, targeting persistence. Um, I will uh, go on to the to the next um, project now, which is targeting efflux pumps. Um, so, what are efflux pumps? They are a primary mechanism of antimicrobial resistance, and they essentially spit out the drug. So, the, most antibiotics work by getting inside the cell. Efflux pumps will pump out the antibiotic into the um, exterior of the cell, so that the antibiotic can't be effective. Um, and efflux pumps are there in bacteria to pump out almost any stressors. Um, so that means they can often pump out lots of different types of antibiotics. So they're associated often with multi-drug resistance rather than being specific to a particular type of antibiotic. And the bacteria we've been looking, on, uh, looking at for this is primarily, primarily salmonella, but also E. coli, designated as high priority pathogens by the World Health Organization. And they use something called the, uh, an efflux pump called the ACRAB pump which is what I've pictured on the right over here. Um, so this is work um, done by George, who's one of our PhD students, whose viva is coming up soon. Um, but it was in collaboration with Laura Piddick and Jess Blair, who are microbiologists at Birmingham, but also John King at Nottingham, who many of you will, will know. Um, okay, so efflux pumps are only, bacteria don't want to have their efflux pumps switched on all the time because it's, it's a waste of energy. They only want them switched on when they're actually needed. So they're subject to um, a, a gene regulation networks which determine when particular proteins will be, will be produced. And this is what the gene regulation network looks like for the ACRAB pump, which is the one that we are interested in. There's also, I will mention ACREF, which is a homolog of ACRAB. Um, so it is also an efflux pump, but it, it's a sort of secondary one. Um, it's not, this is ACRAB is, is the primary one. So to try and understand what's going on in here, I've split things up by colour. 
Um, so the blue lines are the activators. Um, so the activators usually have an A on the end of the protein. If you're not familiar with gene regulation networks, then we, we have the gene transcribing mRNA, which will um, give us the protein, which is why things are, are labeled twice. Um, so we have positive regulators in here. The one really to mention is RAM-A, and this is gonna come back um, later in the talk. So RAM-A has its own positive feedback loop so that when it's switched on, you get tons of it. And RAM-A um, positively regulates directly the ACRAB um, operon. So if you've got lots of RAM-A present, you will have more ACRAB and more efflux. It also regulates ACRAB indirectly by switching off this local repressor here of ACRAB. So this is an inhibitory signal. So when there's antibiotic present, these things are all switched on to make sure that you get lots of ACRAB. If antibiotic is removed to switch off the production of ACRAB, then the, the red lines come into play. So that's when you have, for example, this local repressor here switching off ACRAB um, expression and another local repressor NVAR up here switching off repression and um, switching off activation of both of these efflux pumps. There's a repressor further downstream um, called RAMR, um, which acts directly on this activator RAMA, um, which is the one that I'm, I'm saying is important. And I put a dashed line here because RAMR is very important in multidrug resistance because there are actually strains of um, salmonella that have a non-functional RAMR protein. So that um, repressive action there doesn't happen, which means you tend to have much higher levels of RAMA, regardless of whether or not there's antibiotic present, um, which gives you higher levels of ACRAB and more efflux. So these RAMR mutations are associated with multidrug resistance. So when we started working on this, we were asked to look at whether or not um, RAM-A would be a good target for inhibiting efflux. Um, so could we inhibit RAM-A and essentially bring the mutant levels of efflux down to a normal wild type level or, or below? So gene regulation network modeling, typically um, that there are different approaches to it, but one standard approach is big systems of ODEs to represent everything. So we've got variables for all of the mRNAs on the left-hand side and variables for all of the proteins on the right-hand side, and they, they match up. Obviously, we have a huge number of um, parameters in here, and we never managed to get hold of the experimental data that we were um, uh, we, we, that we thought we were promised early on in the early on in the project. So we, we had to do most of this project without any experimental data at all. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to include these two projects. So the first one with Chloe, we had lots of experimental data. We could do um, an awful lot with that. But with this one, um, it's looking at finding alternative approaches if you can't get your hands on experimental data. So we don't know what most of these um, parameters are likely to be. So we've non-dimensionalized the model, which has lost us a lot of parameters um, to begin with. Everything looks a lot tidier here. Um, I, should, I should just mention actually, the most of this is normal mass action. Well, it's all mass action kinetics, but everything looks quite straightforward apart from these sorts of terms, which um, relate to um, regulators binding to um, operons to either inhibit or activate transcription. And they get particularly complicated when you have multiple regulators binding at the same site. Um, so back to parameters. So we've non-dimensionalized our model, which means we can estimate sizes, relative sizes of non-dimensional parameters instead of um, uh, specific values of individual parameters. Um, so these are all of our non-dimensional groupings. Um, and the parameter down here, I don't know why I put it in the bottom corner, it should be at the top really, um, is one that we know is going to be small. So K2 prime is a low level of transcription of a particular gene, and K2 is the activated level of activated rate of um, transcription of a particular gene. So we know this is something small divided by um, something much larger. So we're going to designate that uh, um, small parameter epsilon. And then we can choose sizes of all of the remaining parameter groupings in relation to, to that value. And we did that obviously in conjunction with the biologists, making sure that um, our assumptions were what they expect of the, of the biology. So that enables us to choose um, sizes for all of our different non-dimensional parameters. And then we can exploit asymptotic analysis for that. So we can scale all of those parameters, plug them back into the model. So now we have epsilons popping up in various different places and perform asymptotic analyses on that. So the first thing that often people do when they're doing asymptotics on these kinds of models is actually jump straight to the steady state behavior. We didn't actually do that, but I am gonna jump straight to the steady state results and then, um, and then turn back around and come back to the, the beginning in a moment. 
so as in topics, and I have got a slide that explains this a little bit more in case there are people here who aren't um, familiar with it, but asymptotics enables you to get um, simplified um, approximations of the full model behavior. So we wouldn't be able to derive our uh, analytical expressions for our steady state from, from these equations, but if we look at the asymptotic approximations, then we can get analytical expressions for all of those, um, all of the variables. And I won't show you those, I'll show you something else that we did instead, which was a sensitivity analysis on those steady state approximations. Um, so we're looking at relative sensitivity, looking at the rate of change of total efflux, so from the two different efflux pumps in response to changes, changes in each individual parameter. We varied parameters um, over appropriate ranges using Latin hypercube sampling um, of, I think it was something like 10,000 different um, samples, it was probably a bit of overkill, um, to look at which of these parameters um, affects the total amount of efflux most at steady state. And we've ordered them here from least sensitive to most sensitive. Um, some are positive and some are negative, which is why it's not that easy to track um, what you're doing as you go through. Now, some of the most sensitive parameters in red here, I've labeled it as unrealistic, but it's either unrealistic or it's obvious. Um, they're parameters that we, we're not really considering as targets, either because they capture too many different um, mechanisms and it's impossible to tie down which would be the important one, or it's just something like, um, I think beta, for example, is literally just the transcription rate of the, the ACRAB um, genes, which obviously is going to be a, um, a, a sensitive target for um, reducing efflux. These, RAM, these, these non-dimensional proteins are the ones that are associated with RAM-A, which is the one that we thought would be a good target for um, inhibiting efflux, and they actually turn out to be some of the less sensitive um, parameters, whereas MVAR, for example, up here um, is potentially a better, a better target. So if we were to just look at the steady state analysis, then it looks as though RAM-A actually isn't a particularly good target. But we didn't just do this, we did a full time dependent asymptotic analysis. So if you've not come across this sort of thing before, what this is is breaking down your full numerical solution into distinct time scales, each of which have a different um, asymptotic approximation on each individual time scale. Um, so you, for each time scale, you have to scale your variables um, according to what size they are on that particular time scale, um, and then take the leading order balance, and that gives you a massively simplified approximation on each time scale. So just to show you here, this is for the, the very early time scale. All of our variables are small, so they're all order epsilon. Um, so if we were to scale all of our variables with epsilon, um, and plug the new scaled variables with the hats on into our equations. On the left hand side, the epsilons would cancel because you have one on the top and one on the bottom. And on the right hand side, you start to see epsilons appearing in front of all of our variables on the right hand side. And then you can take the leading order balance, so the, the largest terms in your, in your equations. And um, so on the right hand side, all the terms on the, sorry, on the right hand column, all the terms on the right hand side have epsilons in front of them, so they're all um, small. And so the leading order balance is simply that the um, derivative is equal to zero. Whereas some of the ones on the left-hand column have got um, uh, order one terms on the right-hand side as well. So you can discard all of your, your small terms and you end up with a system that is much, much simpler, as you can see here, that approximates the full behavior, but simply on that first time scale. And then you need to match your um, asymptotic ex expansions between each time scale to make sure that you get smooth transitions between. So just to prove that this works, I've just picked one variable where the graphs look quite nice. This is um, uh, one of the mRNA variables. You can see very early on, this is our asymptotic approximation. The blue line is the full model solution. And you can see it captures the behavior really at the, at the very start. On a later time scale, we've got a new asymptotic approximation, a new balance of um, leading order terms, and we capture the behavior nicely for a little bit longer. So the blue line is the same in all of these plots. And then as we move through, we've got again on the later time scale, a new approximation where you're now catching this downturn. And then one last one that I'm showing you here for the, um, for the steady state behavior. So what's really nice here is it enables us to really capture which um, terms are, um, which reactions are dominating the behavior on each individual time scale. Now there were 10 different time scales, but a lot of those time scales are actually quite similar. So we can collapse um, some of them onto each other and actually just simplify it down to five different timescales, which I will show you schematically rather than, um, rather than with the maths, because uh, 
the, otherwise it's just equations and equations. So these are all, this is our gene regulation network again with all the arrows removed apart from the ones that are active on the early timescales. So on the early timescales, we get production of some of the proteins, but not, not all of them. As we move through, we start to see different behavior emerging. So this, these secondary transcriptional activators, which aren't um, particularly important, start to um, kick off some transcription of ACRAB at low levels. And then when we move through, then this local repressor kicks in to actually inhibit this early transcription that we got on earlier, that we, that we got from the secondary transcriptional activators and to um, keep ACRAB levels down. But what you see is RAM A, the positive feedback loop starts to, to kick on fairly, kick in fairly, fairly early on. And then on the next time scale, because now we have lots of this RAM A protein, we get both the direct activation of efflux and the indirect activation of efflux dominant at lead-in order. So this is when RAM A would be a good target. And then if we move on to the next and final um, time scale, then RAM A starts to get degraded. So that direct activation at least is switched off whereas the local repressors are what are dominant later on, such as this NVAR one, which was the, which was the parameter that um, came up as being um, as really quite sensitive. So this, so RAM-A actually might still be a good target for inhibiting efflux, but you have to time it correctly. So you have to time that inhibition of RAM-A when RAM-A is actually um, affecting um, efflux, which is actually earlier on in the, in the treatment cycle. So we do think RAM-A probably is a good target, um, but, but you would need to consider exactly when you, you would administer that, uh, that inhibitor, which could, could work very nicely because um, you could just admi administer it at the same time as when you're adding um, antibiotic in. Uh, but if you, if you weren't able to do that and you had to do something later, then MVAR would be a, a better target. So to summarize this section, targeting efflux regulators does have promise, but really I wanted to include this section to, to show the sorts of things that we've been doing in the absence of experiment, experimental data. And our asymptotic analysis have helped us to identify potential targets and also provide information on appropriate timing of dosing. And that's something that we found has been really important in all of the antivirulent studies that we've looked at is that they, they don't just work if you use them um, in the most intuitive manner actually timing when you would use them um, is, is really important. And this work under review at, um, at JMB with uh, George as, as first author on that. Um, so I think I'm nearly running out of time, so I will skip through uh, the last section and just go to my final summary slide, uh, which is that we think there is potential to develop effective alternatives or adjuvants to antibiotics, but those predictions really aren't always as intuitive as you would expect them to be. Um, but mathematical modelling can help with um, designing treatment strategies. Hopefully, hopefully I'm preaching to the converted um, with that one. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you all for listening and I will take any questions. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for your really nice talk. Um, I would like to ask everyone um, who wants to ask a question either to unmute themselves or you can also ask them in the chat and I will read them out. Can I ask a question, Ivo? Yes, of course. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Really nice talk. Hi, Rachel. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the pseudomonas model and the well mixed mm -hmm. assumption. Um, so, for pseudomonas, if you have an infection where the pseudomonas is in a kind of surface bound form, so you've got them rather than being in a uh, a suspension in a, in a broth in a flask, but you've got them kind of crawling around on a surface, yeah. I guess, wound healing. Um, what, 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 what do you think you'd need to do in terms of extending the model or whether this, this transition between rods and spheres you still see on, on the surface? Be really interesting to know your views on that. Uh, that is a good question, actually. So, so we don't know whether or not you would still see the spheres on the surface or whether or not this is something that happens in a more sort of planktonic environment. Um, actually, the, the third uh, set of slides that I had that I didn't go through today is a model of Pseudomonas um, in, a, in a burn wound um, where, the pseudom where the bacteria binds and unbind from, from the surface. And in those experiments, we, we've not had any, we've not witnessed any um, spherical cells forming in that type of infection. Um, but you're right, if, if it's the case that they do um, arise in that sort of scenario, then you would need to extend things, whether or not it's into a I mean, I guess a, a biofilm, I don't think there's any evidence that they would form in biofilm models. 
Um, but it could be the case where if you have um, bacteria binding and unbinding, then when they're in that unbound state, then the spheres could form then as well. Um, and we've done a little bit of work on that. Again, we started with an ODE model, but we're developing it into a sort of reaction diffusion um, kind of PDE model um, to incorporate that. And that is something that we could look at um, incorporating into the um, into the free bacteria, but we, we haven't done so yet. So I think I think there's lots of different directions we could we could make the model more realistic uh, in. But I, I think we, we sort of held back from doing that because we we really don't know enough about how the spheres affect infections and what role they play in infections. We've, we've really only seen um, what they're doing in the in the lab at the moment. Thanks so much. Are there any other questions? If not, I have one. <laughs> so um, when uh, you talked about your um, asymptotic analysis, um, I have not so much experience with asymptotic analysis. Um, so I have seen some um, studies, but I have never seen something where you have so many time scales. So um, how would you identify um, 10 different time scales. Um, is the assumption that the parameters are really just um, slightly different or um, how would you how would you get yeah. 10 different time scales? It's a good question. So I, I, I went over very quickly how you do this sort of analysis. So the, the, the 10 time scales falls out of the analysis. So you don't sort of choose how many there are. It's just literally what the mathematical analysis tells you. And that the reason you get so many is because of the balance of different um, parameters and the, and the variables appearing at different, um, in different sizes over, over time. So you get a slightly different balance as you go through. If you had as fewer equations, fewer variables, and um, fewer different parameter sizes, then you would get a lot fewer timescales. And that's the, the sort of classic examples you see of this matched asymptotic analysis tend to have like at most three different timescales that you that you see. But so essentially what you do is you start with you, the, the first timescale is usually quite obvious um, to see what will happen because you know which, whichever of your parameters is the largest one, that will most likely determine what behavior happens early on. And that enables you to choose what the appropriate scalings are at the beginning. And then you need to identify which are the um, which are the which reactions will occur on the on the next time scale, which are the the most which, which are the next largest um, reactions, mm -hmm. balancing in how large the variables are as well. And then and then you match them across the time scale. So you it is it's not um, it sort of looks a little bit like black magic. I sometimes think when you when you're looking at it, but it's it's all very mathematically rigorous. So you can't really you can't just invent which time scales you want there. It all falls out of the analysis as you as you go through. But it's it's quite a lot of work. Um, to not not know how much yeah. information you're going to get at the end of it, but you do tend to get quite a lot of information about the dynamics, and that's what in, that's what's interesting is you really get this what is what's really driving the behaviour at different points in your in your simulation. But does that mean that your model basically um, that your model parameters basically vary about um, roughly something like ten orders of magnitude? Or, uh, yeah, and the the okay. yeah. It, yeah, so the non-dimensional parameters will be yeah. The, the, yeah, the sizes between the non-dimensional ones. Yes. Um, and the and so the the analysis that you get is dependent on your initial choices for those parameter sizes as mm -hmm. well. So it's not it's not robust in that sense. Yes. But we have looked at alternative parameter choices to see how how if we if we'd chosen um subtly different um parameter sizes, would that then affect the analysis? Um and it it, it the within realistic ranges of premises that we the ones that we think are realistic at least um our qualitative behavior comes out to be the same um regardless so uh, we're sort of satisfied that we've, we've covered enough bases through by looking both at the asymptotics and if not i have one <laughs> so um when uh, you talked about your um asymptotic analysis um i have not so much experience with asymptotic analysis. Um, so I have seen some um, studies, but I have never seen something where you have so many time scales. So um, how would you identify um, 10 different time scales? Um, is the assumption that the parameters are really just um, slightly different or um, how would you how would you get yeah. 10 different time scales? It's a good question. So I, I, I 
went over very quickly how you do this sort of analysis. So the, the, the 10 timescales falls out of the analysis. So you don't sort of choose how many there are. It's just literally what the mathematical analysis tells you. And that the reason you get so many is because of the balance of different um, parameters and the, and the variables appearing at different, um, in different sizes over, over time. So you get a slightly different balance as you go through. If you had a fewer equations, fewer variables, and um, fewer different parameter sizes, then you would get a lot fewer timescales. And that's the, the sort of classic examples you see of this matched asymptotic analysis tend to have like at most three different timescales that you that you see. But so essentially what you do is you start with you, the, the first timescale is usually quite obvious um, to see what will happen because you know which, whichever of your parameters is the largest one, that will most likely determine what behaviour happens early on. And that enables you to choose what the appropriate scalings are at the beginning. And then you need to identify which of the um, which of the which reactions will occur on the on the next time scale, which are the the most which, which are the next largest um, reactions, mm -hmm. balancing in how large the variables are as well. And then and then you match them across the time scale. So you it is it's not um, it sort of looks a little bit like black magic. I sometimes think when you when you're looking at it, but it's it's all very mathematically rigorous. So you can't really you can't just invent which time scales you want there. It all falls out of the analysis as you as you go through. But it's it's quite a lot of work. Um, to not not know how much yeah. information you're going to get at the end of it, but you do tend to get quite a lot of information about the dynamics, and that's what in, that's what's interesting is you really get this what is what's really driving the behaviour at different points in your in your simulation. But does that mean that your model basically um, that your model parameters basically vary about um, roughly something like ten orders of magnitude? Or... Uh, yeah, and the the okay. yeah. It, yeah, so the non-dimensional parameters will be yeah. The, the, yeah, the sizes between the non-dimensional ones. Yes. Um and the and so the the analysis that you get is dependent on your initial choices for those parameter sizes as mm -hmm. well. So it's not it's not robust in that sense. Yes. But we have looked at alternative parameter choices to see how how if we if we'd chosen um subtly different um parameter sizes, would that then affect the analysis? Um and it it, it the within realistic ranges of premises that we the ones that we think are realistic at least um our qualitative behavior comes out to be the same um regardless so uh, we're sort of satisfied that we've, we've covered enough bases through by looking both at the asymptotics and the company and numerics as well yeah. okay yeah that does sound really interesting i mean i i can imagine that when you couple um processes that are really very different so something like gene regulation and um more physiological processes that they are on um, quite different timescales. And probably it will also be um, not completely straightforward to simulate um, these models then. Yeah, it can be. And it can be difficult choosing the, the hardest. Well, it's probably not the hardest bit. Some of the analysis is harder, but the, the sort of toughest bit is at the beginning actually, is actually deciding what those parameter sizes should be, because you're, you're right, you, you are comparing. Although you're comparing things of similar dimensions, you can be comparing things or, or of the same dimensions. You can be comparing things that are, are very different. So it's quite tough to, um, to decide what a sensible choice of those parameters would be. Yeah. But they okay. tend, the numerical simulations tend to run quite, quite smoothly. It's not. Um, with a with a stiff solver in MATLAB, it doesn't take long. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. So um, thanks a lot for your very nice talk. No uh, problem. Thank you and, for having me. <laughs> yeah, everyone who wants can um, give a clap. I will do that as well um, <laughs> if I find it, and um, a thumbs up and everything I have. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for uh, coming to our seminar. And uh, yeah. <laughs> All Thank the you best. Very much. Thank you for having me. You too. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>